Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at Banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at Banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Banyan Books In Conversation podcast. I'm your host, Ross McKeechee, and very, very excited at our guest today, Mr. Michael Ignatieff. Welcome, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Good to be here. Michael Ignatieff is a university professor, writer, and former politician. He was born in Canada and educated at the University of Toronto, Harvard, and Cambridge University. Until recently, our honored guest was the rector and president of the Central European University in Budapest. He stepped down at the end of July 2021 to stay as a professor in the history department. Between 2006 and 2011, Mr. Ignatieff served as an MP in the Parliament of Canada, and then as leader of the Liberal Party of Canada, and leader of the official opposition. Our guest has been named to the Order of Canada, is a member of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada, delivered the Massey Lectures, and holds 13 honorary degrees. At Harvard's Kennedy School, He was the director of the Carr Center for Human Rights from 2000 to 2005, and Edward R. Murrow, chair of the press, politics, and public policy from 2014 to 2016. Between 2012 and 2015, he served as the centennial chair at the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs in New York. Mr. Ignatieff is the author of 20 books of fiction and nonfiction, translated into 20 languages. He is a Booker Prize finalist and winner of the Governor General's Literary Award, as well as the British Royal Society of Literature's Heinemann Prize. Today, Michael Ignatieff is with Banyan Books in conversation about his latest book, On Consolation, Finding Solace in Dark Times. Rejecting the solace of ancient religious texts, humanity since the 16th century has increasingly placed its faith in science, ideology, and the therapeutic. How do we console each other and ourselves in an age of unbelief? On Consolation doesn't just take us on a journey through the history of consolation in the Western world. It is a sweeping examination of the evolution of Western thought and culture through the lens of the lived experience, the people responsible for many of our greatest religious texts, philosophical doctrines, music, and arts. Each chapter features the portrait of a historical writer, artist, or musician, and one of their most influential contributions, from the books of Job and Psalms to Albert Camus, Anna Akhmatova, and Primo Levi while giving the story of their human struggles and search for consolation, which unite us with them across time in the human family. If this book opens your heart to feel the grief and sorrow that has led human beings to seek consolation, this book will also stretch your intellectual understanding of the people, events, and creative endeavors that have given shape to the Western world as we know it today. If you'd like to learn more about today's distinguished guest, please visit his website, which is michaelignatieff.com. 
www.banyanbooks.ca. The Banyan Books community, please join me in a warm, warm welcome for our guest today, Mr. Michael Ignatieff. Michael, thank you so much for being here. Good to be here, Ross. Thank you for such a, wow, such a extended and over generous introduction. But uh, I'm, I'm anxious to talk to you about the book. Yes, me too. It's a wonderful book. And I wanted to start with maybe a, an entry point uh, for how you came to write on consolation. I, I pulled a quote off of your website, actually, uh, which leads into a question. So you said, my 20 books keep returning to a few recurrent themes, human rights and the fate of moral universalism in a world of clashing and competing values, liberalism as a political theory, as a practice and as a way of life, and our struggle to maintain democratic freedoms. You go on to say my most recent work, especially on consolation, has taken me in a new direction to thinking about the history of our attempts to console ourselves for the timeless ordeals of life, death, loss, and tragedy, and how we manage despite everything to live in hope. So I'm just wondering if you could fill us in on what led you to that change of direction and the focus of your work. Uh, a great question, Ross. And, you know, anybody who's written a book knows that you, the sources of why you do things are a little mysterious, even to you. <clears throat> you write the book to figure out why you're writing the book, if you know what I mean. Um, <clears throat> In my case, it began by accident. I, I was asked to give a speech about politics and justice in the Psalms in a choral festival in Utrecht in the Netherlands. And my wife and I went to this incredible weekend of all the Psalms were performed by four wonderful choirs. And I kind of, I gave my lecture, but I, I can't even remember it very well. But what I can vividly remember is the impact of hearing the Psalms, all 150 of them sung by these beautiful choirs. So I, I came to talk about justice and politics and came away thinking about the Psalm, uh, consolation. And, um, because I felt comforted and I felt, and then I thought, well, I'm comforted, but am I consoled? And there's a difference between comfort and consolation. And so I then began following my nose and <clears throat> began to read the Psalms more carefully and think about why they're so consoling. And, um, uh, I, I think my first idea that led me to the other chapters in the book was that the thing about the Psalms, even if you don't believe in God or salvation that they promise, um, they know what you need consolation for Ross. I mean, that's the thing about them. They, when you read the Psalms, you, you're, you're talking to people or listening to people who know what it is to be lonely who know what it is to fail, who know what it is to doubt, who know what it is to be in despair. And that's why they've been read for 2000 years. You, you open them and you feel I am in company with somebody who knows what I feel. And, and that sense of being in company with someone who knows what you feel is the heart of consolation, I think. And, um, and I think it's, you know, the project is really an attempt to say, um, when you read all these books, the one thing you come away with is the realization you're never alone. You are never alone. There is always someone who's been there and knows pretty well exactly what you're going through. And that I think is very consoling. I think it's extremely consoling because it connects your own private experience to the deep continuity of, of human experience and human life and human wisdom. So. So that's how the project started. And that's kind of how I, 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 I then just followed my nose, uh, one book to another and another piece of music or another painting or whatever. So. Right. One of the things that is, is, is runs through the book is what you just touched on that it's, it's through that, that relationship to others that we truly find consolation and you touch on, especially with the, the Stoics. It, the, like Cicero, for instance, you know, the philosophy, the doctrine didn't carry him through his struggles. He wasn't able to find consolation in that. I'm wondering if you can speak to this point. Well, I, you know, one of my discoveries in the book was, was that a guy like Cicero was the author of famous letters of consolation and 
consolatio was an actual jar in Roman letters. You know, but people would write these letters and then they were so famous that they would get printed, or not printed, but they would get circulated. And so he was the master of a genre of consolation himself. And then his daughter died right in the middle. His daughter died and he was absolutely bereft. And astonishingly, we have all the letters that he wrote between February 45 and August, September 45, when he's going through the crisis of losing his daughter. And what's fascinating to me is that a man who is the master of the genre of consolation, the doctrine of consolation, found it completely useless when he experienced real, passionate, searing grief. And that's a theme, I think, throughout the book, which is that the gulf between doctrine and experience, the gulf between the words and what you actually go through. And, and, um, and I think one of the, 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 the amazing things about Cicero is that he goes through this, writes every day, uh, desperate letters to his male, mostly male friends, but then slowly over six, seven, eight months of deep inner struggle begins to pull himself out of the pit. You know, it's very, it's, it's very touching. I, you know, I, I don't relate to the kind of famous Cicero of the Republican ideal, the toga and all this stuff. I don't, the Cicero I really connect to is that Cicero is just broken down. Who's just wandering through his estate, tearing his hair out, you know, literally. Um, and that gave me a great sense of sympathy for him, a great sense of connection. It, it, it's as if he'd earned his right to tell me something. Now that I know that about Cicero, I will listen to Cicero because he's been through something that, you know, anybody who's been through that kind of grief no, understands. One of the things that I found very interesting was you talk about this uh, legacy that Cicero and the Stoics left to men in particular, this uh, repression of emotion. And um, I'm wondering if you can speak to how that, how you see that playing out today and how, and how men find consolation in their lives. Well, you know, men, men aren't supposed to cry, or at least my generation of men aren't supposed to cry. And we, and there's something to be said for that code of stoic restraint. I, you know, I, I used, I admired it when I saw it in my parents and, you know, that there's something very dignified about holding yourself together. And what's dignified is that you're doing it for the sake of others. That's what's, that's, what's good. You're, you're controlling your own emotions. So other people don't break down. So other people aren't overwhelmed and that's very noble, but it exacts a tremendous price and Cicero, you know, going back to the Roman Stoics taught a thousand years of men to believe that manliness was not, uh, confessing or admitting to sorrow. Tears were for women. So consolation was very gendered. You know, the consolation for men was to stiff up her lip. The consolation for women was you, you know, you covered your head with a, a veil in Rome. You tore your garments. You women were allowed to cry and scream. And in fact, their role was to express the grief of the whole family. And so consolation is gendered in that way, in a way that I think has been very difficult for women because women get lumbered with a, a role, men get lumbered with a role. And I think one of the messages of the book is we want to pull that stuff apart, you know, and, and be freer and and understand the roots of the things that are chaining us up when we experienced uh, grief and, and, and sorrow. Thank you. One of the other wonderful themes is, you know, the, this progression from religious faith, uh, in salvation in the afterlife in paradise. And then we start seeing this, this change in thinking that there's not really any consolation in just believing in something in the future. It's, it's almost considered becomes to be considered a false consolation. Can you tell us more about that? Well, I think we're the heirs of, 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 of two things, Ross, we're, we're the heirs of the religious traditions. One of the messages of the book, you know, I'm not a believer personally, but I think it's idiotic to put it bluntly for us to ignore the Bible. 
to ignore the Talmud, to ignore the Quran, uh, to ignore uh, these immense works of of religious wisdom from from all our traditions. You know, <laughs> to walk around saying I'm secular, I won't I won't approach that stuff. Just seems to me to be cutting off your your hands. Um, so that's the first thing. And I'm convinced that these works can console us, even if we don't happen to believe in their promise of salvation. That was my point about the Psalms. But we're also the heirs of something else, which is a revolt against religious consolation. We forget how deeply that revolt went from the, uh, the, seven, the 18th century enlightenment. People said, you know, the reason that life doesn't get better for people the reason that people stay poor, the reason they stay miserable is that they keep putting off their hopes for life to the afterlife. And what we need to do is, is stop consoling ourselves with a dream of the afterlife. We need to build heaven here on earth. You know, I, I'm, an, I'm not a Marxist, but you know, you read the young Marx, the revolutionary Marx who's in Paris in the 1840s, he's just fallen in love with this wonderful wife, Jenny von Westphalen. They've just had their first child and he's struggling to put together a vision of social justice here on earth. And um, he says famously, you know, all, all criticism begins with a criticism of religion, by which he means unless we can free ourselves from the longing to be consoled in the afterlife, we can't create justice in the here and now. And many religious people disagree with that. I'm not saying Marx is right. I'm just saying we are the, we are the children of this revolt against consolation. And, and a lot of people associate consolation with resignation, with acceptance, with putting up with, in a sense, the intolerable. And so Marx revolts against it. The, the Enlightenment revolts against it. And, you know, Freud revolts against it as well. So we're the, we're the heirs of two traditions, a religious tradition which promises and defines consolation for us as the hope of an afterlife and a revolt against it, which is saying, let's build hope and meaning and justice here on earth. And I, I, I try to talk about both of those traditions in the book. Right. Yeah. And, and um, just going back from Marx a little bit, we, we, we come to this, the Scottish Enlightenment you know, where there was this revolt against religious faith and that led to the arising of this belief in, in the self-actualization of the individual, which led to capitalism, basically. Now, then we come to Marx and he sees, he sees no difference between the chains of religious faith and the chains of the capitalist wage earners and laborers. Yes. How did he and try to fact, address that? And in fact, one of the things that is so fascinating about Marx is that he sees religious alienation, the ways in which we project our hopes into the afterlife, that alienation as the same kind of alienation we go through in, in, in capitalism. So his criticism of capitalism comes out of and is part of his criticism of, of, of religion. And despite the fact that, you know, the, the descendants of Marx, which include Lenin and Stalin, inflicted unbelievable uh, crimes and horrors. Um, I think it's always important to go back to this young Marx because this is the kind of poignant hope that um, socialism and communism then so often betrayed. But let's go back to the dream and not lose the dream because there's a great deal that's extremely powerful in what certainly the young Marx understood. Right. Yeah, and you, you touch on you just touched on how how his ideas were used to inflict pain and <clears throat> jumping ahead again to Anna Akhmatova, the poet who wrote Requiem. And can you tell us a bit about her suffering, what she bore witness to, and how she found consolation in this idea of witness? Well, she's an extraordinary figure. I, I hope that some people in the audience. I'm delighted. There's so many people who've tuned into this. I hope that people will rush out and not buy my book, but read Anna Akhmatova because she's, you know, one of the greatest poets of the 20th century and one of, one of its most heroic figures. She was born 
before the First World War. She published very famous poetry during the First World War and right after. And when the communists take over Russia, she's basically shut down for 20 years. Her son is then arrested. Um, she lives in poverty. She's <laughs> ekes out a living through uh, translations. Um, her son is then taken to prison, and she then famously goes to a prison in Petersburg every day to try and get news of her son. And she's in a queue of hundreds of women in the bitter winter cold. Um, and one day, one of the women behind her whispers, do you think you can describe this? And Anna Akhmatova turns around and said, yes, I, I think I can describe this. And then something like a smile crosses the face of this woman who's all um, shrouded up against the coal. And Anna Akhmatova tells this story at the beginning of a famous poem called Requiem, which is the poem she dedicated to the millions of people who were imprisoned, tortured, and shot and sent to the gulag by Stalin. And she believed as a poet that um, her vocation, her role, was to make sure that the memory of this suffering was never, never lost. And um, I, I think one of the, the things that we need to understand about Akhmatova is that we, the people who came after her, were her consolation. That is, she believed that the point of her poetry was to tell us never to forget. It's the same instinct, by the way, that um, Primo Levi, the great Italian writer who survived Auschwitz, um, we were his consolation. He wrote, if this be a man and the drowned and the saved is and some of the greatest writing in the 20th century in the belief that, you know, the generations that would come after would remember thanks to his witness and that we would make sure that these abominations never happened again. And, um, so we have a we have a responsibility uh, created by these great uh, works of of literature and and um, and their courage and their lucidity and their verbal brilliance and are an inspiration. Hey, you talk about this this chain of solidarity through time that that we have in, within the human family, thanks to these people who have borne witness and shared their experiences. I want to, I wanted to just say that your account of, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name, right? Miklos Radnoti. Yeah. The Hungarian poet was another, yeah. oh man, was that ever moving and heartbreaking? Well, it's, it, it's again, the, many, many of people watching this may or know about Anna Akhmatova and some more will know about Primo Levi, but almost no one will know about the third figure I talk about, who's called Miklos Radnoti. He's a Hungarian poet. As some of you may know, my wife is Hungarian, so that's how I came across this extraordinary story. The thing about Miklos Radnoti is he was a, a young Jewish poet of great brilliance who is sent to a labor brigade, um, as many Jews were in Hungary and forced to work in a in an iron mine in Serbia during the war. And then they march him back um, across Hungary uh, in 1944 as the Russian troops advance. And he's the only poet I know who wrote poetry on this death march. He wrote, I think, five poems uh, that simply describe what's happening to him on, these, on this death march. And the death march ends with his death. He dies on the death march. And his the, these poems, which are some of the great poems in the Hungarian language, were found on his body after they exhumed his body in 1946. And again, the, the point about this is that he, he wrote because he believed that poetry would survive. And if poetry survived, then the memory of what he and hundreds of people on this death march had gone through would not be forgotten. And that was his consolation. That consoled him as he put one foot against another uh, in head of another in this horrible march with the SS shooting people and uh, the 
Russian guns coming closer, um, what consoled him was the thought that something will survive. And, and this is deeply moving and deeply human. And his poetry is now read uh, in Hungarian schools. The problem is that it was Hungarians who actually shot him, not the Germans. Uh, so it's a bitter, tragic, terrible story from the 20th century. I'd like to just share a quote that you that you had about these these people, Ak Akmatova, Primo Levi, and Miklos Rodnoti, about their bearing witness and how that applies to the present day. And then lead that into a question. So speaking on the faith that witnesses of tyranny like they had, you write, they were saints too, because they had faith in us, the generations who would come after them. They would have given in surely had they not held on to the conviction that their writings would survive and find readers who would take their truths to heart. And then you write, we were their consolation, as you just mentioned. When they composed verses on death marches, when they remembered poetry in the camps, when they memorialized all those who had kept vigil in the cold, they were sustained by the hope that we, the succeeding generations, would ensure that they had not spoken truth in vain. They were consoled by the thought that we would remember them. And then you ask the question, but have we? And I know this book was published before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that in light of, of this. Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a searching question, Ross. I'm a little at a loss for words in a way. Um, um, there's a part of me that thinks that we did listen to Primo Levi. We did listen to Anna Akhmatova. We did listen to Radnati. Um, and because we did, and because we were determined that fascism, which is what, and Stalinism, which is what caused these terrible crimes in the 20th century, we learned we can't do that again, because it'll literally destroy the human race. Um, and we've had 80, 90 years of peace as a result, not, not simply because we've had prosperity and a nuclear deterrent, but also because we learned something about these horrible ideologies of death that, uh, these great poets stood up against, but we're now looking at, at a resurgence of what can only be called an ideology of death. I mean, I, I. You know, I'm, I'm of Russian heritage, but I have two grand, great grandparents, uh, buried in, in South central Ukraine in little Orthodox church. Um, and I, every day I look and try to make sure that this little place near Pogrebishi has not been bombed. I mean, it's just, it's just unimaginable to me that this is happening and, um, and it is an ideology of death in the sense that it's a denial of a people's right to be free. It's a denial of the entire structure of the international order created in 1945 to put fascism and tyranny in, in a box from which it couldn't escape. It's ripped up that UN order. It's ripped up um, the idea of the self-determination freedom of peoples. And it's, it's visiting death and destruction on a people for no other purpose than to serve the fantasies and desires of a authoritarian regime led by one man. I mean, it's just, um, everything that we thought we had uh, escaped after 1945 has, has come back and there's no point being, you know, tearful about it. It's just. <laughs> history has this horrible way of, of, of returning in this way. And, and we have to be, um, we have to be as firm and, and clear sighted as, as our parents were, my, my father and mother were in London through the entirety of the second world war and they were bombed and they lost people they loved and they, they served their countries. My father served Canada, my mother served Britain and. They served with people who were willing to die to stop Hitler and die to stop 
what he was doing and i you know nobody wants to go back to that and and the but we have to have that kind of moral clarity now because uh the thing that's insupportable at the moment and i think is a torment to anybody watching the ukrainian situation is that we kind of know how this is going to go that artillery is surrounding kiev kiev is a beautiful city it is ironically the uh, the heart of the beginning of the origin story of the foundation of the russian state with the kievsky lavra and the conversion of saint vladimir and all these origin stories that are the origin of of the russian state uh, but it's the capital of a people who want to be free and the artillery is surrounding it and at some point they're either going to shell it or starve it out and we will have to decide what to do and anything we do risks a wider european war and possibly a nuclear war and nobody wants to go there nobody wants to risk that but there is a real possibility that we'll be sitting here in a week 10 days watching people being shelled to bits as they are already being shelled to bits in Mariupol and Kharkiv and these places. And it's just, you know, I'm an optimistic guy, but every consol this relates to the book, every consolation I drew from history, that is the belief that we had, we were not going to repeat World War II, that we were not going to re recreate these autocratic dreams of death and tyranny have been ripped up by what's happened since February the 25th. It's the worst thing to happen in my adult life. And I've, you know, you know, I was, I was in the former Yugoslavia during the Yugoslav wars. I've been to Afghanistan during the, when the Taliban took over, I've seen some pretty terrible things, but this is really the worst because it's such a threat to the global order we took for granted since the Second World War. It's such a reminder of the enormous dangers of autocratic regimes run by single people who have these messianic um, dreams. And we thought we'd finished with that and we're back to it. I'm not saying anything, unfortunately, that everybody on this call or watching this program doesn't already know. I don't, I simply don't know what to say about it, except that we need to give the Ukrainians every possible assistance to resist and that their courage in their resistance has astonished and inspired everybody. Um, I just think we shouldn't have any illusions that the Russians have superior force, superior artillery, and they are led by an absolutely ruthless man. And I have great fears that they are going to pulverize Kiev in order to force that government to collapse. And then we will have a dilemma because I just don't know whether the international system can, and you know, our prime ministers and our leaders can actually stand there and do nothing when a European capital is being leveled uh, and a democratically elected government is being you know, kill. I mean, I, you know, that's the thing that's coming at us in the next 10 days. And, and I haven't got a smart answer to that because I don't know how to manage the risks and the risks are nuclear war. I mean, that's what we're talking about. But then the moral hazard on the other side, you do nothing and you watch a people die for everything that we believe, democratic freedom, self-determination of peoples, they will die for the things that we believe. And that's a horrible thing to watch. It, uh, it, it brings me to one of the key points through the book. And, and that is many of the figures throughout history have, have realized that we can't have any illusions when it comes to consolation or else it's not truly consoling. And this idea of, of responsibility, there needs to be responsibility. And particularly I think of Havel, Vaclav Havel and his idea of living in truth. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, Havel, 
Pavel's a man I very much admire because he's a very imperfect guy, lots of lots of weak points to him, but he was a man of extraordinary courage, and he I capture the period when he's in prison um, serving a three and a half year sentence, and it's really tough um, in the early 1980s. Um, and one of the things he's trying to deal with is that there was a moment in the 70s when he appeared to betray his principles and agreed with an interrogator that he would back away from his dissident work. And he was very deeply ashamed of that moment of weakness. And so in that prison, he has to come to terms with that moment of weakness, that moment of moral failure. Um, and he, he does so by basically saying, you have to own all of a failure. You have to own the person you were when you failed. You shouldn't own more than is your responsibility. That is, there are many things that can create a failure, but you have to own the piece of it that's inescapably yours. And this requires a tremendous attention to the truth of your own life. And we all know it's extremely difficult to be truthful about our own life. We tell lies to each other ourselves all the time. We tell lies to get through the day. You know, it's going to be all right. I'm doing the best I can. Life's terrific, you know, onwards and upwards. And, and inside we're quaking and shaking and not sure. And there, but there has to be a moment when we face ourselves in the mirror and say, you know, that's, this is the reality. This is what we have to admit. And Hubble is a wonderful study and a man in prison doing that to himself, figuring out what the truth of that moment of betrayal was, coming through it, owning all of it, and then deciding uh, I can go on. And um, so living in truth is a kind of, uh, you know, motto for me and for, for, for many people, thanks to him. And then, you know, six years later, he's the president of Czechoslovakia. You know, he's a extraordinary moral figure. And uh, I try to tell the, tell the story in the in the book, but it it's because it's the chapter that connects this problem of the, the, it connects consolation and truth so clearly. Because there isn't true consolation if you don't tell the truth. Um, you false consolations abound. I I talked to some a minute ago talking about Ukraine. We had these false consolations about the future was heading towards more democracy, more globalization, more progress. And these seem to be false consolations. We're, we're now face to face with the, the extent to which we deluded ourselves and nothing terrible about that. I mean, just, but well, we got to wake up. That's all. And, uh, tell ourselves a story about the future, which is truer and makes a big place for tyrants, autocrats and monsters to be frank. So. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to let our audience know in a few minutes here, we'll be taking some of your questions for Mr. Ignatieff. I see lots have already rolled in. Just go ahead and type them into the Q and a tab on zoom there. Whenever a question comes to mind, we'll get to as many of those as we can. You know, someone else, uh, I really, I really liked the, the final, um, portrait of, of Cicely Saunders and her, her work with, with hospice and creating palliative care in, in England. And, you know, she also was someone who was looking to bring in her own way, bring more truth into the work that she was doing. Can you tell us about her? Yeah, she's an extraordinary woman. I, I met her myself in the, uh, toward the end of her life. And she was this great big, almost six foot, um, kind of county lady with a, you know, one of those real upper class English accents, you know? But she was courageous, she was gutsy, she was funny, and more than anybody else, uh, founded the modern hospice movement and palliative care. There's some also some great Canadians who are involved, this Balfour Mount in Montreal and some others. So it's not just Cicely Saunders. And I was trying to write about this movement because um, she understood something about modern hospitals that I discovered when my my mom and dad uh, died, uh, which is that hospitals are a terrible place, uh, to die mostly, um, no, no insult to the wonderful nurses and doctors who do their best, but they're not, they're created to cure people. They're not 
they're not built to help you die when there's nothing more you can do. And both my parents died in hospitals in, in very difficult circumstances. And she understood that we needed to create a place and a time for people to face the reality of their deaths. And she discovered something else, which is, and she learned this from one of her patients, one of her patients, she asked one of her patients, a working class woman in London, you know, where it hurt. And the woman memorably said, um, all of me is wrong, you know, all of me. By which she meant, you know, as she, this was a woman with cancer that was terminal. It wasn't just the cancer. It was the fact that she hadn't made peace with her children, or that she was still estranged from her husband. She was worried about her, the finances. She was, you know, she was worried about so many other things just beside dying. And so Cicely Saunders understood you had to create a hospice place where for two, three, four, maybe months, you had time to get your life in order and look towards your death and achieve some kind of serenity about it. And, and, and she understood something else, I think about this is Cicely Saunders that I had a, has had a big effect on me since writing the book, which is that she, instead of thinking of death as the end of life, she, she very much saw it as, as a place where you, as a moment where you could still do a tremendous amount, there was a tremendous amount of purpose that you could achieve. Uh, sometimes the most important things you ever do in your life, you achieve at the very end when you're with your, your children or your parents or your wife or your husband, and you say the things that haven't been said and you tie up the loose ends that haven't been tied up and you, and you are reconciled to each other and you, you're, you're, you're at peace with each other at last. And then the thing that you can do if you have the composure and your pain medication is okay and you've got some time, you can do one final thing for them, which is take away the fear of death itself by the manner in which you die. And of all the things that I learned in the book, I think this was the most, in a way, inspiring to me. I, I don't, look, I, you know, Russ, I don't, I don't know what it's going to be like when I, I may be just crossing the road to get a newspaper and go kaboom. But if I have a period in which um, I can do something for other people, it would be wonderful if I was able to do my little bit to take away from them uh, the fear of dying. Because we used to do this, you know, if you look back in the deep history of dying, that, you know, people knew their time had come and they would lie down and take a few days and people would gather around and, and, and they would, they'd be ready to go. And um, so we can always learn from the past in terms of how we face death. And Cicely Saunders is the person in the whole book who I think did more to console people about the prospect of death than, than any of the other figures in, in the book. And I, as I say, I was lucky enough to meet her. She was just a fantastic woman. You know, one of those people you just, one in a million, inspiring, funny, unsentimental. Um, she'd been a nurse. That was the other great thing about her. She was and very practical. You know, if when she talked about dying people, she knew, you know, if you put a pillow here, it made a difference. And if you did this, to the medication that made a difference. She was very, a wonderfully practical sense of how you help people. And um, that sense of the practicality of consolation seemed to me really inspiring. It's wonderful. It, it, it reminds me of, of your chapter on, on Albert Camus and, and uh, his book, The Plague. And of course, there would have been many people with the COVID pandemic who, who may have died sudden, unexpected deaths. And you talk about the, the, how the, his book, The Plague, was flying off the shelves uh, at the onset of the pandemic. What was there in that book for us to learn throughout this time? Well, it, it's a, I tell the story of the book as a story of how Camus, who had tuberculosis and was sent to a small remote village in France to recover, 
gets caught. Uh, he wants to go back to Algeria where he comes from, but he gets caught because the Germans occupy the whole of France. And so he spends the rest of the war in occupation. And it's the story of a writer using literature to find consolation for the fact that he's alone, he's afraid he's dying, and he's under German occupation. So the book, the whole book is an attempt to give meaning to an experience that would otherwise have overwhelmed him. And he begins to see the plague as a kind of metaphor for, for the, the dead, frightening intensity of German occupation. And he then begins to understand, um, above all that, uh, and I think it's something we, we discovered in, in the COVID pandemic is, um, the worst of the pandemic was the isolation, the solitude, the silence, the apartness, um, and the best part of the pandemic and their worst and good was when we came together and fought together and, uh, uh, celebrated our fantastic caregivers together and, and, uh, managed to keep, uh, solidarity going through an absolutely excruciating, excruciating couple of years. And I think that Camus the Plague is also a celebration of solidarity. And it's also a celebration of, uh, of compassion. There's, you know, the, the, the passage in the book that's always meant most to me is is a passage that people mostly don't notice. It's a small part of the book, and it's just the description of one of the doctor's friends dying, and he's alone, uh, except for the doctor's mother. And the doctor's mother is a little old lady who sits with him all night, so this man will not die alone. And it's one of the most moving uh, passages in literature to me, he just, um, evokes this silent solidarity, this old woman sitting beside a dying man. So we won't die alone. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty good definition of how we console each other. How, how, and, and, and it, and that's why I'm fascinated by consolation as a theme, because I think it's the deepest and most intense and most important form of cons of of solidarity that one human being can display towards another. And let me just say, because I, I don't, I, I, there will be people possibly listening to this who've had, who suffered uh, terrible loss. I do know that there are things for which no consolation is possible. I really do. And the book is, I hope, respectful of that. Uh, I, this is not happy talk. There are many experiences we have in life for which no consolation is possible. But to the degree that consolation is possible, it's about human solidarity, just being together, getting through it together, remembering that other people have been through this. Um, that solidarity is, I think, at the core of, of Camus' book. And it's why the, you know, the book means such a lot to me and to so many million other people as well. We've got a couple of nice questions here from the audience, and this one relates to, to the pandemic. It's from Jill who says during the pandemic, a prominent public person has kept saying in quotes, hope is not a strategy. What is the relation of hope to consolation? Great question. Um, I think, and this is controversial. Some people just disagree with me that. Uh, consolation is the attempt to find meaning for suffering, failure, grief, and loss so that we can continue to live in hope. And by hope here, I mean simply the belief that we can go on. I don't mean a big religious hope. I don't mean the universe is meaningful. I just mean the hope to go on. Uh, at the, the belief in ourselves that we can go on, that we can get through this. Consolation is, is meaning giving so that we can live in hope. It's different from comfort, by the way. If I were to comfort you, Ross, in a situation, I wouldn't have to say a word. I just, we'd sit together and have a beer maybe, or just, you know, give you a hug or something. But if I'm consoling you, I have to give you some meaning that gives 
that that gives some give, gives you some belief that you can get through loss, grief, and failure, and and keep going. And that's what I mean by hope. Thank you. Thanks for that question, Jill. Uh, this one is from just initials L M. L M says you talk about facing death. In my experience of hospices in Canada, they don't permit MAID medical assistance in dying. I'm curious about your thoughts on MAID in relation to facing death and how MAID might provide for consolation. Boy, this is a, I, I, I want to be careful here because to be perfectly frank, I don't quite know what I think about this. I'm ashamed to say it. Uh, one reason I don't know is that Cicely Saunders, who I've written this chapter about, was a ferocious opponent of any form of assisted dying. And, and she and I had a polemical exchange about this because there was, um, there was a form of euthanasia that was permitted in Holland, in the Netherlands, while I knew her. Uh, and she was violently opposed to it because she felt that it was a kind of counsel of despair. Her belief as a, as a physician and as someone who pioneered pain control was that it was possible to create regimens in hospices that would take away the pain in such a way that people could recover a sense of perspective and a desire to, to go on living. And she felt that if you, if you, uh, uh, believe in, uh, that assisted dying sort of short circuits that it says there's a you know th there's an easier way out of here you don't have to go through that she said it's a false choice you you we could we could create a regimen that would make the end of life entirely bearable and and i think because she was a very religious person she had another part of this which is she just believed that our lives are not ours to dispose of as we wish and that's a, that's not a belief that I have, but it's a belief that she had and many Canadians have, to be frank. Um, I, I, let me just say one more thing, um, for, for a variety of reasons that are just accidents in my life, I have seen, um, I've known four people who had what's called Lou Gehrig's disease, the, uh, this absolutely devastating, um, illness, which basically shuts down all of your functions until you're, um, uh, you can't speak or talk or you, you can, you can still think of, of course. One of the cases, and the one thing I came out of these four different cases is that in two of the cases, I thought the, what these people want is assisted assistance to die. No question about it. But in a third case, which happens to have occurred in Kamloops, I went out to Kamloops to see this guy, unbelievable man, an English teacher in a high school in Kamloops, surrounded by his family, <clears throat> able to communicate only by blowing through a straw onto a computer, touch sensitive computer screen. This is in the early nineties. And I thought this man was the most inspiring example of courage, but also joie de vivre and love of life that I'd ever met in my life. And <clears throat> he didn't. He, 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 he wanted to go on. So even in the face of absolutely terminal, uh, crushing blows like, uh, this disease, there are people who do want to keep going and they, it seems to me they should be allowed to keep going and they should not be pressured in any way to continue their lonely journey to wherever they feel they want to go. And, and, and this man who I'll revere to the end of my life just showed me that there is life absolutely at the end of life and it's precious and to be respected. And so this is not an answer to your question. It's too serious a question for me to answer definitively, but I thank you for it. Thank you. Um, this is a very interesting question from Eleanor. What are your thoughts on the worldwide surge of conspiracy thinking and its relationship to providing consolation? Well, that's a, a another, God, this is a good group. What these questions are really searching. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I think a short answer to that question is that I think conspiracy thinking is false consolation in the sense that when you subscribe to a conspiracy thinking, you suddenly think, I understand the world. There's a hidden pattern here that nobody else can see, and I can see it. And therefore, to the degree that understanding is consoling, it's, it's a, you know, you think, ha ha, I'm the only one around here who really understands the deep machinations that have led us to this point. Um, and and I think that's false consolation because conspiracy theories have the property that they're not true. I mean, there are, let, let's be clear, there are some conspiracies that turn out to be true and have uh, uh, consequences. But I think conspiracy thinking is a search for consolation in a period when, when history is so hard to understand and so hard to grasp that you, we search for these narratives, these false narratives, because they give us the, the consolation of believing we understand something which we actually don't. And, and I think we, we need to be resolute enough to, um, just face the, the reality. And I think I said this earlier in discussing the Ukraine, we do not know what the hell is going on now. We used to think we did. Now we don't, we are in a new world and lucidity requires us to be amazed, perplexed and not reach for conspiracy theories that give us a false understanding of the world as it is. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, there, there, I think we have time for one more audience question and thank you everybody for, for putting in your questions. Really, really great. This is, this is a, a one from Ian who says, what would you say to young adults if there were one thing to think about on consolation, life, hope? Um, I, I think I just say, look around you, look very, very carefully around you. There is more loneliness and despair just at our elbow right near to us than we ever imagined. I sometimes feel haunted by that, that when I look at my own life at my own age, I often feel that things I feel worst about is that I, I did not offer consolation and loving care to those who were near me and who I could, I could sort of sense were a bit in despair. So just look around you, look around you. Um, just pay attention to the, those, those far away lost looks in people around you that you care about. Um, don't let them go. Don't let them slip away. Um, and don't pretend it's not happening. There, there, there's a, there's a reality in other people's pain and sorrow that we, we need to f face up to. And if, if you're as old as I am, the thing you regret most about your life is that you didn't attend to that as carefully as you should have. Thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been speaking to Michael Ignatieff about his latest book on consolation, finding solace in dark times. A big thank you to our podcast producer, Jacob Steele, for everything that he does. And of course, to everyone that works at Banyan Books, from the owner, Colin, all the way down to everyone front of house. Michael, any parting words, anything to add before we go? Now, just, uh, just to tell the folks who tuned in, and I see there are quite a few of you, just how much I enjoyed it and, and, uh, and thank Banyan Books. Um, uh, I, I had a real surge of missing kits and Jericho beach and places I used to know in Vancouver. And I hope I'll get back one day, be able to walk through the doors of the store and say hello. So thank you again. It was great. And thank you, Ross, for, for keeping it all under control. <laughs> thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for branches of wisdom a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. And I'm your host, Ross Makichi. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, 
and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com.